Hi. Okay, well, I have to get my bearings here a little bit. And uh, yes, my name is John Fox, and yes, I do come from Netflix. And I'm concerned that the branding may be a little bit off because Netflix to me sounds like Netflix. So I'm wondering, are we going to have to re, you know, change the name to it to like Dofflix or something like that? Um, and there's something else that I need to say that this is the first time I've ever given a talk where there's simultaneous interpretation. So if you don't mind, I have to do a little test to see how it's working out. <clears throat> The speaker is very smart. The speaker is very strong. The speaker is terribly handsome. The speaker is entirely modest. Okay, so the reason I did that is uh, actually I did grow up, I, uh, I was alive during the Cold War and there was always this phrase that was used, trust but verify. So afterwards I'll be listening to the tapes and see what the interpreter said. All right, so let's see, this should do it. So the first thing I want to talk about is like, what do I mean when I say a world-friendly mobile app? Um, so the first thing to say is that it, it, it has to look and feel like it's, it was made for each country by people who actually live there. That's the first point. And the second thing is that since it's mobile, it has to work well in a wide variety of, of, of what you can only call hostile network conditions. So those are the two major themes I'm going to be talking about. And what I have to say is that we, we care about this a lot. We sweat these details, and we're constantly refining it. And it's, I tell you, it's not very easy to produce a quality product like that, and it's absolutely true that we make mistakes sometimes, but we do really care about it, and that's why we ship weekly, and so that we can uh, keep refining it and make people happy. Um, so... I joined the company uh, almost three years ago, and basically a couple of months after I joined, we turned on Netflix for the, all the rest of the world. So uh, there was that hashtag Netflix everywhere, and that means that uh, we're localized in 28 different languages, and we're, we're still adding. Um, and I have to say, it's, it's, it's been an interesting ride. So. Uh, when I, when I was first, when they, they talked to me about it, it's like, hey, how would you like to build an app where you can watch TV on your phone? I'm like going, dude, what are you smoking? Nobody watches TV on the phone. Uh, but the reality is that people do. And actually, we're seeing tons of growth in mobile. And, and it kind of makes sense if you, you, you look at it a little bit more. And, you know, in, in some parts of the world, Europe and North America, a device like this is kind of an adjunct device. You know, you watch TV at home, you plop down on the couch, open up the commander, and just start binge watching. And a device like this for you is maybe something for, for discovery where you want to figure out what you want to look at next or talk trash about something on Facebook or, or whatever. But it, it's, it's a kind of a supplemental device. But in some parts of the world, this is your everything. So people who, you know, in formerly undeveloped countries that are now developing very, very quickly, they went from, you know, not having a desktop computer to maybe not even having a laptop, but going straight to having a mobile device. And that's everything. It's their information device, it's their entertainment device, and uh, they, they, they may be spending a lot of time commuting, for example. So they're not home all that much in the same way that is, is more typical in, in North America and Europe. And so that really uh, presents a, a bunch of challenges in, in terms of user experience and testing to make something that really works well in that environment. So um, one of the ways that we do this is, is you know, there's no substitute for having the developers actually going out in the world, all different places where Netflix is used, and, and testing. So uh, one of my colleagues, Asta, she, uh, we started on the same day three years ago, and she got married this past December, and she was very foolish. She invited me and Ben and Steve uh, to come to her wedding, and she promised me that I would become like a star of a Bollywood dancer if I could use these moves. So we did go, and there on, on the left, that's me in the, the Delhi subway, and you kind of have to figure that, that uh, indeed everybody's watching you know, lots of a video on, uh, there. Um, on the middle, that's actually where we're in a, a lake in Udapur, so that's kind of further north, and it's a beautiful lake, and we wanted to test the, the mobile connectivity, and particularly we wanted to test you know, how this new mechanism for talking to our, 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 our backend using a, a more advanced edge server called Open Connect and, and putting some more data through that than we had done before. And uh, so we figured that the best test is to be able to see how soon we could have Arnold Schwarzenegger talking in pumping iron. So when it came up, we were all like, instantly was like, I am stronger, I kill you now, I kill all the competitors because we launch faster in the rural India than you do. Um, and on the right side, that's, that's British Ben, uh, and we stopped off in Shanghai. Now, I said that Netflix was available all over the world. There's actually two countries where it's not available. One is China, and the other is Syria. 
Uh, so I'm not ready to go to Syria quite yet, but I did enjoy going to Shanghai, and uh, there we took the opportunity to, to see if, if downloaded video would start up properly even when you're in, uh, there. And so we said, Ben, could you please go test this? What we want you to do is go out in the middle of a busy intersection and see if you can start the mobile stream. And he was like going, what happens if somebody tries to run me over? No, it's, it's a problem. Just go right on. It's fine. No, no, you're almost at the right place. Oh, how's it going? Is it working? It's working? And uh, so we, we, he did manage to, to, to stay alive. Um, so we're happy that we got him back. But these are some of the things that, that we actually do. It's, I'm being slightly funny, but it's actually true. You, there really is no substitute. So let's start talking about localization. So I, I have to say one thing is that I, I actually really do love language a lot. Uh, my first job when I was my last year of university and for one year after that was working at a, a localization, a, a translation and, and training company. And uh, that was a fun experience. And so I, I, I do speak French, I do speak Italian, I speak excellent fake German. Is there anybody who speaks German in here? Okay. All right, so, uh, and fake German is very easy. All you have to do is take a bunch of German words and then squeeze them together into a single word that's like 37 syllables long and ends with something about taking pleasure in the, the observing unhappiness of others. <laughs> so if you hear schadenfreude at the end of your phrase, you know it's German. Um, but, but anyway, I, I did you know, learn a lot about the idiosyncrasies of, of different languages and it, it's turned out to be helpful for that. So let's dive in. So, you know, as is to be expected, you know, our, our development language is English. So all the layouts, the designers, when they're working... Oh, wait, hold on a second. There we go, okay. <laughs> I don't, normally, I don't get out of bed to do a model shoot for 30,000 rubles or less. But, you know, okay, anyway, so... Uh, so, <laughs> so, yeah, so all the layout is done in English. That's the starting language, and then you have to take it from there. So this is the, the screen of the, of the downloads uh, tab in our app, and it has this one button right away, center, find something to download. And so uh, English is the baseline for line width. All right, so then if you look at it in other languages like Japanese and Korean, they're much more compact in terms of, of line length, but they also have some very, very specific uh, challenges, especially those that have phonetic, uh, phonetic components to, the, to their, their uh, language as well. And so, but, you know, that, that's what it will look like there. Uh, and then some, some languages uh, compared to English, like German, Polish, and um, French. Are there any French people out here? Oh, good. No? Oh, we can make fun of them. Good. Okay, so... <laughs> because French, French is very, very expansive, and so, you know, what ends up is, like, you imagine that as they're translating the phrase, they're, like, you know, philosophizing at the same time. It's like, instead of just saying, find something to download, it's like, find something to download and waste your life, you fool. <laughs> But no, but in all seriousness, it does expand. So you can see in this example that you have to have two lines of text to be able to, to make it work. Um, so yes, the French can be, and in fact, often are difficult. All right, and so uh, other languages, as you may know, uh, like Arabic and Hebrew, they, they lay out right to left. And so that's its own kind of uh, difficulty. Um, one thing I did want to point out in terms of details, if you look at the, the, the typeface, we actually use a custom Arabic typeface um, because we want people to, to kind of, when they look at the user experience, it, it should feel like you know, a luxury hotel in Dubai and not you know, a, a text of, of, of something else you know, that, that may cause uh, you know, concern. So, uh, and then there's Thai. So Thai is another interesting case um, because Thai has all these characters. If you look up there, kind of these accent marks, which make for insanely tall line links, and that can 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 cause you some heartache. Um, and so. Uh, knowing that these are the types of challenges that you come through regularly for the language you work on, what I suggested when I got there, and I said that, you know, the only way to have success with this stuff is to take all the engineering team and send them to four-star luxury hotels around the world so we could have, you know, training in-country and to, to, to see that it works. It's like, if you want us to, to make something good in French, there's no short, you, nothing less than the Hotel Crillon in Paris will do, and tie with all the kind of long, the line links, we need to be like a, a have massages all the day so we can make our body long and lean to, you know, m you know m resemble the characters. And then, you know, for, for compactness and efficiency, there's no substitute to, to going to the finest sushi restaurants. So th that's what I, I asked for. And uh, I called uh, our CEO and I said, Reed, dude, uh, let me borrow the corporate jet for a couple of weeks. And he said, yet. 
In fact, I think he said Helm yet. <laughs> so we had to go back to the drawing board and try to find a, a different technique. And so uh, there is something called pseudo-localization. Um, and so we, we have actually gone in all, all uh, for pseudo-localization. So what it is, essentially, is it's a technique for taking a base language, like English, and making it behave as if it was other languages. So you, you add additional characters, so you, it goes about 30% wider, and you add you know, uh, accent marks and other kind of things that extend the, the, the top line and the bottom line. And so the point of it is, is that we actually do it so that by default, uh, when you run the app under debug, you are always seeing pseudo-localized pseudo English text. And that's actually on all platforms. It was kind of a decision that we made as, as a group engineering organization across all platforms. Um, and so what, what's nice about it is that you can see kind of right away if there's a, if there's a problem. Um, and so it's, it's been really, really helpful for it, but because you know, problems are caught early. And in our first instance of it, we did it just for the user interface on the app. But in fact, to really to, to make it work properly, you also have to have it work with the, the, the metadata, the descriptive information about the movies, the titles, the synopsis that come back to the server. So what we end up actually doing is that we send a, a, a fake language code of en-xa to our server. And then that basically means that all responses are also pseudo-localized. And there, you know, you can really see um, that you, it, it keeps you from drinking too much because if you come into the office in the morning and it looks like that, and you're just like, oh, fuck, did, what did I do last night? I was like, no, no, it's okay, it's pseudo-localization. <laughs> but but it, it is important, and, and this, is, this is kind of the difference between, you know, what, what we're able to do uh, with taking it as a, in a, a kind of a company-wide uh, initiative. Otherwise, you know, if... if if you don't happen to have, uh, as, if you're not as big an organization, what I can tell you is that uh, Xcode does allow you to pseudo-localize as well, and I, I highly recommend it for doing it. It's one of the best ways to be able to test how your app is going to behave in other languages. Um, and uh, there we go. All right, so, uh, so then you think, okay, now we understand what some of the problems are, and I think that the first thing you have to, to do is use auto layout. Um, and I was kind of surprised because I, I've been developing you know, with Apple technologies since they were, it was next step. And so when auto layout came out, it made lots of sense to me. And I know that there were a lot of developers, a lot of people from, from other programming languages uh, or environments on the team. And they were like, ah, oh, auto layout's a pain in the ass. And it is. Auto layout absolutely has been a pain in the ass. It's gotten better, um, but it's still a pain in the, how do you say ass in Russian? There we go. What he said. Thank you. <laughs> um, but but the but and but but the, the important thing is is that you know whatever issues you may have for its speed or whatever in some in some cases you're just you're gonna you'll, you'll kill yourself trying to do it especially when it has to do things with with reversing the order of it. So. Um, it's, it allows you to basically to describe the behavior that you want, where a lot of times for a button is, I want the text label to go in the center, and then I want there to be a border on the edges, so no matter how much you have to expand, make sure you have that. Even then, though, you know, if we think back to the, the French example, you're always going to have to make some compromises because you're trying to get a range. And so what ends up happening is that you have to have a relationship with the designers and start asking these questions from an early moment in the design, saying, thank you, it looks great in English. What happens when, when the French get a hold of it? So we've kind of trained ourselves as a practice to really think about that a lot. Um, so I, I'm not going to go into how auto layout works. That's for, for you to find out. With, with There's a million talks on WWDC uh, about that, but it's mostly a friendly reminder that you need to use it. All right, so pseudo-localization is, is one technique that we have. Um, the other thing is dealing with human languages, because as good as pseudo-localization is for, as a technique, sometimes you, you have to be able to, to, to deal with other languages, and that's particularly because we do so many A-B tests, right? And so in order to, do, to, to, to make it work, what I ended up having to do as a developer is I would maintain multiple user accounts in different languages, and you would have to log in and out of, of those. And it became incre incre incredibly tedious. And as an engineer, when something is tedious, you try and figure out how to engineer a solution to it. So uh, what I did is, is build uh, something called the in-app language switcher. And so basically, for debug build to our app, there's a preferences pane. You can tap on it, and then you, it gives you a list of all the languages that we have and allows you to just tap on one. And 
it essentially restarts the app or restarts, it doesn't restart execution of the app, it kind of restarts the user session. Um, and I think it, it will make sense when, when, when you look at a screen movie that we are going to do here. I, I prepared this movie, I'm gonna be like Tim Cook at Apple or Steve Jobs, like, I prepared this movie for it, I, I'd love to show it to you if you'd like. Would you like to see it? Yes, okay, very good. This, this, this is some award, you know, this is, the, the, this is gonna get an Emmy Award, I think, at some point. So here you are running around in the application and it's in English and everything is delightful. Uh, the world is wonderful. Now we go to the, the more menu and that's where you put all these extra things and then we go to localization debug and we can then say, choose an English and we're gonna start with Arabic. So pay attention to, you notice that now everything is laid out right to left and we've, we've gone and refetched the entire uh, home screen. That's called the Lolomo for list of list of movies. And you can see the display page for the same title all laid out crisply in Arabic and the order of, of buttons goes in the, the different direction and uh, everything is good. You have to, when you're using this, you have to remember the position of the, the uh, debug menu, otherwise you'd get completely lost. So I have kind of muscle memory to be able to help get me out of here. And so uh, we can switch to another language like Japanese and you switch that and it, that's ja, ja, J-A, like Japanese, not ya ja for German. Um, <laughs> and you see now everything's bringing it back. And again, the metadata, so the, the row titles, the artwork, everything now in Japanese and you can exactly see how things are, are working. Um, and let's see, where should we go next? Let's travel along and go to, oh, I don't know. I'm gonna pretend I'm doing this live. Uh, let's go to Thailand. So switch to Thai, or th. And again, now here you can, you can see, especially if you look in the bottom on the tab bar, how wide that is and how tall it is. That took a lot of effort to be able to make these tab bar items fit properly. The, the, the Thai really was, uh, it was a, a bit of a challenge, but everything seemed to have worked out in the end. Our heroes made it work and uh, they were richly rewarded by, by, oh wait, no, we weren't. We weren't taken to Thailand. <laughs> All we did is get to keep our jobs. <laughs> All right, so now we're gonna switch back to English. And again, one thing also you might notice as we scroll up, I want you to pay attention to something that we'll be talking about a little bit later. All right, so uh, in the back of your mind, you're thinking to the, well, that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, I'm wondering, can I do this too? And the answer is, duh. <laughs> or yes, yes you can. I'm gonna sound like Obama now, yes you can. So uh, it, it actually, I have to talk a little bit about some of the differences between how localization works on iOS versus Android. So does anybody develop on Android as well? Yeah. Okay, so uh, you know, normally I would say I'm not terribly jealous of, of my colleagues who work on Android, but in terms of localization, they have it much easier because basically in, in, in Apple land, you have one language in which the, the system is set and then your, your application, when it launches, kind of makes the assumption that, well, if the, if the device is set to French, your app should be in French. Um, and the reality is, is that, that you can't really make that, that type of assumption because there are plenty of people who happen to live in multilingual households. It's very, very common that you might have a user, profile, a user account with multiple profiles and you switch easily. So that, let's say you want your kids to learn English, you make the kids profile in English, or let's say that you want to make your, you know, you may keep your operating system in English, but you really want your, your user experience in Netflix to be in Arabic. Um, so it's there, you really run into some problems where you're, you're fighting the system. But at a fundamental level, uh, when it comes time to localization, this is the starting point for it. So everybody's familiar with NS localized string. You, you put it in your, your strings when you're doing formatters and in the end, uh, it's just, as you know, a C macro, which is then responsible for calling, calling NS bundles method, localized string for key, value table. So uh, you dive in a little bit to it and you can say, all right, well, instead of using NS localized string, you know, we're, we're, we're big boys, we can make our own C macro, uh, which we did called NFLX or Inflix, Onflix localized string. And what it does predictably is it's, it calls our own localizer and it basically calls this method localized string for, for key. And so, well, what can you do when you do that? 
So it's very simple that you can basically say, well, instead of using the bundle that was in the systems locale, you can load your own damn bundle. It's amazing. Software, you can do whatever you want. And so when you have that picker, as you saw, it says, OK, I'm going to choose Japanese. And you can find out where the Japanese.lproj folder is, load a bundle for it, assign that, 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 that bundle as an instance variable you know, on, your, on your singleton, and, and then basically return just the, the localized string for key from that bundle. So it's, it's a pretty simple technique. And uh, pro tip, make sure you always wrap that in a debug statement, because you don't want to ship this and have them have some customers seeing pseudo localized strings in their app, because you forgot to take that out, because customer service will be calling up. So everybody's pissed off. They want to know what you put in the water, because they look at the app, and it's all this strange language. So make sure you debug statement only. All right, one moment. Uh, this is time for a commercial break. I would like to say that I am a sponsor of Aqua. Clear water. There's no branding here. This is the finest water that money could buy. Mm. Moscow Municipal's finest. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay, so next topic. Uh, getting quantities right. So this is really talking about how you e add really good uh, fit and finish to your application. So. Uh, some languages are, are very, very particular in, in, in terms of how quantities are expressed. Um, you know, in English, it's very, very simple. It's like you talk about one episode, and then after one, it's the same. Two episodes, five episodes, 100 episodes, 12 gazillion episodes. It's, it's very, very simple. So uh, you tend to see this a lot. This is kind of the lazy English pattern where you just say, I'm going to do a string with format. And no matter the quantity, you'll put the S in the parentheses, and you leave it up to your user to kind of manipulate in their brain. And you could do that. Um, but you ought not to, um, not only because it looks bad in English, but it will just completely fall over and die in other languages. So you know, then what we see is like, all right, well, I'm a smart programmer. Thanks for yelling at me, Mr. Localizer. Um, I'll do something like this, in which case you do a string format, and you count the number of objects, and you say, well, if it's more than one, I'll do a plural format, and if it's, you know, otherwise, I'll do the single format. And uh, as it turns out, as clever as you may think, that's also a bullshit. Uh, oh, uh, that is a subpar uh, solution to the problem. <laughs> yes, yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> um, so th so th it doesn't work. And, and where it really starts to fail is in languages like Arabic and uh, uh, Hebrew and. Uh, Polish, as, as that's a good example. So it based on the actual quantity. In fact, I think uh, a little bird whispered that says that even Russian has this issue. But uh, we'll start with Polish. So this is episodes, and I'm. Does anybody here speak Polish? Cool. So I can completely mispronounce it. One ochinek and two ochniki, and then five och. Okay, whatever, I can't pronounce it. But the important point is, is this, is that there are actually rules for these different languages saying that from you know, zero quantity should use this. One to three or one to five, which is a definition of few, would use this word. And between five and 10, that's considered many. And then there's something called other for all of that. So there's a ton of complexity into it. And if you had to express that in code, you'd have this abs absurd switch statement that the switch, sta oh wait, one more time. The switch statement from hell. It's hard being a supermodel. It's like, I can't get it. <laughs> Sorry. So, so then this is the, the, the proper solution for this problem is to use what's called a strings dict. I invite you to try and say that without sounding like you're like, hey, strings dict, strings dict, strings dict. <laughs> anyway, so a strings dictionary for the win. So what that lets you do is, is if you look, you can encode those different variations. And so what ends up happening is that it uses the, the count and then says, oh, OK, the number of objects in this particular case is three. And so the, there, there are these tables. It's called ICU. It's, it's, it's something that is a cross-platform standard, but it basically returns, in Polish, three constitutes three, you know, uh, sorry, few, and seven constitutes many. 
So uh, what this means is that when you have strings dictionaries, uh, your code for, for producing the localized string is, is exactly the same as if you were doing a plain localized string. It just basically says string with format. You get your, your, the, the key which is pulled from the strings dictionary instead of the strings file, and it encodes all the variants. And then what you do is that you walk down the street in Warsaw and people are like saying, aren't you the person that sweat the details like that? Here, come, you know. <laughs> Come have dinner with us because you know when I was sitting down and, and using the the download section in Polish, Gracie Frankie was the right the right thing and the office was the right and orange is the new black all worked good and but this this is at the point in all seriousness this shows a level of detail and care and love for your users that you want to have. Okay, time for a second breath. Hmm, so good. All right. Uh, we're going to talk about finding direction. Um, and this is not about your life choices and what you wanted to be in you when you grew up, but this is uh, having to do with, with um, how... <laughs> it, it's about how, how words are laid out on a line. So uh, is anybody here of the, heard of this program called 13 Reasons Why? Yes, okay. So it, the title, 13 Reasons Why, is, is not translated. They don't kind of, you know, say they don't, you know, in French they don't say, you know, 13 motifs pour, something. It's, they just use it 13 reasons why. Um, and so as a result, it, it causes some problems. So this is, uh, this is the problem that we have in Arabic. Okay, so you, you, it's, it's no joke, you end up with this. And, and, and when we first heard it, it came to us, it's like, okay, uh, what? <laughs> 13 why, re no wait, reasons why, you know, it's, it's, and that does, it's supposed to say reasons why 13 season one trailer, right? And when this came to us, like, oh, fuck. I mean, uh, uh, golly, that is, that is a challenging problem. And so, you know, as you said, kind of, the, the, here's the problem, and, and this, this is also kind of a funny story. So this, this is all to blame on the people that implemented Unicode string in, in Macintosh from the early days, and, and one of them actually works, with, uh, two of them actually work uh, there. And so as it comes down to it, it's a, it's a case of sorting order for strings. So you have to kind of decide which comes first, alphanumeric, A through Z, and then numbers. And so uh, in English, the sorting order is alpha characters first, and then numbers. Well, you know, you reverse the order, it's the same sorting algorithm, and that's why you get 13 in the wrong place. Now, this, if you want to really kind of uh, screw with somebody and, and is, is try this. When I was doing this slide in Keynote, I was trying to type the text into Keynote, and it, kept, it ended up, it put the 13 there on the other side. It was maddening. So th this kind of thing is, it's a case where you can't even experiment and see it work on any of the Apple tools. You have to, you, you have to really kind of, scratch your head for a little bit and you say, well, what the hell do I do now? Um, and so the answer, of course, is circus tricks. Now, uh, this is a true story. When I was young, my mom took me to see the Moscow Circus when we were living in New York. It was fantastic. The best animal trainers. Really amazing. And if you look here, you have this, this you know, kind of trainer in there, and you have these lions and tigers and elephants and giraffes and all these animals, and they're like running around in a circle, and he can like, you know, snap the whip in just the right way. It's the left-hand side. Okay, zebra, you go left, and elephant, you go right. And so I kind of remembered uh, that, and I figured, well, uh, there was a, an important life lesson. And so we come up with Unicode circus tricks. And so this is, it's a little bit unfortunate, but there's really no way of getting around it. So uh, we do have some kind of fairly complicated utility methods that allow us to kind of figure out what the hell should we call this particular title? And there's complex logic according to whether it is an episodic thing that has numbers in the episode or whether it doesn't have those and, and whether it's a movie or whether it's a, you know, a, a serialized thing. So we do tend to have it and we do have to have essentially this if statement which says if you're running in right to left orientation and remember that our application may be set to be right to left, whereas the operating system itself is set left to right, so we have to do some tricks there. But if it is, then you need to kind of, I wish I had a laser pointer, so I'm gonna go do this. So over here, follow along, you have to use these very you know, arcane Unicode commands um, like 202B and 202C, which basically says at this point in the string, switch direction and go there. And, uh, 
and that's the only way to be able to get things to, to work properly. So you can have 13 reasons why, right to left, but uh, uh, on the right-hand side of it, and then the Arabic on the other side. So it's a challenge. All right, so now we're going to move on to uh, another example, and this has to do with Korean, and that's uh, called keeping it together. Um, and so uh, with no one cheating, does anybody speak Korean here? No, no, I'm not counting on you. I talked to you. I know you do. Okay, so uh, you, over there, third person in the row, what's wrong with this? Come on, come on. Did you not go to university? No, just kidding. no. So, so yeah, that, 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 it, it illustrates a point. If I look at that as a developer and, I, and I'm testing to see if localization is working, I say, look, I saw these squiggly lines. They're all there on the screen. What's your problem, dude? Uh, but as it turns out, it does contain a serious error. Um, and so, and let's figure out what it is. Well, the problem with it is that those two characters, or that, that run of, of characters, needs to actually be held together, because otherwise it's, it's simply illiterate. And so um, for, for you know, Western European languages, they have dictionaries which are, allow you to, to split things based on actual you know, syllables within a word, and uh, that doesn't ship, apparently, uh, with iOS or on Android. And so you know, the, the problem is, is that, again, our job is to go out into the world and say, hi, we want to be your local source of entertainment and we want to speak with a, with a illiterate voice. And we were failing with that one where the, I think it's the word drama. It was just not reading correctly. Um, and so that, that was a big problem. And so we were scratching our heads and saying, well, what do we do now? So uh, there are many books and, and topics that talk about everything I ever needed to know in life I learned when I was in kindergarten. And one of the important lessons that I learned in kindergarten is that you should hold hands, especially when you're walking through the world dangerously. So um, I spared no expense in performing an internet search to get some unlicensed stock art for this um, and to illustrate a point. So there is actually something called a word joiner. So it is a, an arcane character that you can insert. It's U plus 2060. That sounds like a, like, that sounds like a political slogan, U plus 2060. Um, <laughs> uh, so you can actually insert that. Now, so one of the things we did is, so there's a little bit of, of, of and so the problem existed for Android, it existed on web, it existed for iOS. So um, all, all of our client platforms uh, talk to a, a single repository to get their strings. So they're pulled from a server and they're written into the project at, at, at build time. And actually we can do it at runtime as well. So that really kind of saved us in this particular case because we could do that little regex and insert the word join characters and everything was, was grand, the, the hero got the girl, the sun rose, everybody started singing, and it was wonderful. Um, and so it kind of made me think that this word joiner thing is really uh, powerful, and I'm wondering it, how many people here are married? Some people, okay. Now, some of the people who aren't married, you one day may ask somebody to marry you, and what I can say is that, forget wedding rings. <laughs> you know, you want to be able to say, darling, I can't bear the thought of ever being away from you. Will you U plus 2060 me for the rest of your life? So I'm hoping that, 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 that one day, you know, somebody will write to me, John, five years ago I saw you and I wanted to do something unique and I didn't do that, but I, it's in an inscription in my ring, you know, Boris and Natasha U2060 or something. So, all right, so. All right, so, so my, 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 my point again about this thing is that details like this, they matter. And it's, it's actually really hard to explain it. So it, no joke, it's like I ask anybody here who speaks Korean. It's like, well, okay, I don't speak Korean. And you, not everybody can speak every language in the world, except for the brilliant people who do the simultaneous interpretation. They're amazing. They can do anything, right? They're handsome. They're smart. Yes. No, how much? Okay, no, I'll leave it outside, okay. Uh, anyway, so, <laughs> so the, the, the question is, how do, you, how do you kind of explain to your colleagues why this stuff matters, right? And so uh, before coming to Moscow, I decided I wanted to see some sunshine, so I actually went to Athens, and I spent a couple of days there, and I was staying at a very nice hotel, um, and, but they, they had this little card there in the bathroom, and I'm looking at it, and it's like, wow. <laughs> Again, what I end up having is like, I know I drank some last night, but that doesn't seem correct. Shouldn't the E be up there? And, and, and shouldn't there at least be a hyphen or something? And, and, and then I started reading it out, and it sounded like, save uh, the water. 
Seva the water. It sounds like, you know, like a, somebody who, who's Greek but just trying to learn English. Um, and so if you show that to somebody who speaks English, then you say, oh yeah, if you were to do that in English, you would think the person is, is high. Um, but so that's why we should care about it in other languages, even if we can't tell it exactly. All right, another swift drink of water. Ah. And uh, we're going to now go to the, the next section, which is on networking. So uh, a problem with being a mobile developer is that you know, you're doing your work, you're at the office, you're connected to your fast network, and you just think that the world is great at all times because you, you might typically have internet speeds like that of hundreds of megabits per second. And so it's very, very easy to forget that when you're out in the real world, you know, under best circumstances, you're lucky to get about 10% about that. And kind of more likely, you're going to get, you know, 10% of that. And so, uh, and, but the funny thing is, is that, you know, when we went to, to India, one thing I was expecting, I'd never been to India before. I was like, Ugh, you know, we'll probably have like modem dial-up speeds when we go there. But the reality is, is that uh, you actually get really fast internet connections in developing parts of the world. Why? Well, because you can stick a mobile antenna anywhere you want. It's amazing. It's like, you know, there's no, no regulation. In San Francisco, if you want to put up a new cell phone tower, it takes years of meetings and things like that. Here, they can just like, yeah, we'll put it wherever we want. And, and it's nice because the people who live in that apartment building, if they need to heat up their tea, they take the, the mug and put it up on the roof for a second, and all the, the RF around there heats it up for them. It's great. Um, but all joking aside, then you think, okay, well, you know, what about in, in America? This is Grand Central Terminal uh, in New York, and, you know, at rush hour, there's 12 gazillion people that are running in there, and they're trying to catch their train, and they're running, and they're trying to finish out who killed who on some particular show, and then hoping that the, the network doesn't drop out, and because everybody else is doing that, you have two problems, people running into each other and butting heads, and also kind of screwing up the, the, the networking uh, for everyone else. And so, as a result of this reality, you know, we have a mantra at the office which we called aim low. And so aim low really kind of refers to the fact that we have to constantly be sensitized to the idea that you have very limited network. Uh, and so there, there are all sorts of things you can do. You know, I mean, one thing's sure, if you've got images down here and, and the kind of, this is a search result, and let's just, I, what I want to do is, is have a look at the, the movie first. Would you like to see it? Thank you, okay. So, I want you to notice a couple of things. So we start to do the, the searching. Oh, yeah, I just have to press the button first. There we go. And you, know, you start to get the results. And what do you notice? Well, first you get you know, one image, and then here's the reality. It's like you can, compress the, you, know, you can compress the image until they're screaming for mercy. But the reality of, of networking conditions is that you may get a little burst of bandwidth, and then it trips up for a little bit. So you know, stupid pet tricks that, you, that people were used to doing on the, on the web you know, in the beginning of the early days when people were on dial-up, you would do things like put an alt tag in an image and the browser would very helpfully show you, you know, a text uh, placeholder while you're doing it. And then at least you could say, oh, this is the object I want, let me tap on it, I don't need to see the picture, let me get on the way. And so we kind of, everything is, it's back to the future for that. And so we do, you know, stupid pet tricks with UI image view categories. Um, and so we have this thing where we can set a fallback text for an image view and, you know, code like this where you say, let me go load the image, and if everything is wonderful, I will then, uh, if I get it back, I will set the fallback text to an empty string so it disappears, the image goes in, and everything is great. So it's, you know, sometimes you just have to use the tried and true stupid pet trick methods even in the modern, you know, compiled world of, of native apps. All right, so here's something else, uh, captive networks. So. Uh, it refers to kind of a very hostile form of, of, of network that exists on planes. So uh, oftentimes you'll have these open networks which they say, you know, please connect to this network called virus or, you know, <laughs> or free in-house entertainment. So you, you get on a plane, your device is set up, it connects to any network, and then you think everything's wonderful. Hey, they have really great free network. And then you actually go and try to use it and then you see something like this. Um, where you're making a request and you're asking for JSON, but then they give you back 
HTML. It's like, why did they do that? Well, the reason is, is because as, you, as you've seen it, when it happens, you connect, and, and then if you're on a web browser, it all of a sudden redirects you to another page saying, hello, would you like to give us your credit card, um, and then we'll steal you blind. No, would you like to give us your credit card, and you can have 10 minutes of internet for only $7,000? Sure, sign me up. Um, so, but, but it's not obvious, so you kind of have to, to, to dive down, and you have to, to, to guard against what I call successful failure. So, you know, this is a kind of a case where you've got a, an HTTP 200 response. So I said, great, everything's wonderful, but no, let's have a look about it. Look at the MIME type. And if the MIME type is, you know, in this case, text, then that gives you an idea that you have a particular action code, which we might call guest network. And so the, the point is that you have to be kind of uh, able to handle these types of situations. I, you know, I'm kind of jealous that you're taking pictures of my screen instead of me. OK, good, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. All right, so now we're going to talk about uh, image reuse. So this is, this is, you know, even when you have great network conditions, there are some cases where the most important thing, believe it or not, is not the product of our Photoshop team, but it's the video. We're a video service. So um, th sometimes you just need to kind of, you know, say, I've already fetched some stuff. Now let's get along on the show. So I want to talk about this. So uh, this is the previews. Uh, this has became very popular, this top row of these little 30-second previews. Um, uh, and so let's have a look. I think some of you are already familiar with this. So it goes directly, and it starts the playback as soon as it possibly can. And you can swipe through and, and see each of these different uh, you know, short clips of video. And, and it, it works pretty nice, even surprisingly in bad network conditions. And so uh, this is a case where you must thank heavens for the, the GPU, because it can help keep people amused while data is loading. So it's really, this is on, uh, we're lucky that on iOS we get to have really high powerful uh, machines that can do this type of, of image blurring. But if, if you look at it very slowly, it's kind of clear what we do. We took the box art image, which we had already downloaded, it was always cached, the title art, already downloaded and cached, and then we have these kind of, we had our designers make these kind of gauzy images which you could cycle through, so it's already blurred, but it, look, it kind of simulates what video looks like even though it's not, you know, it hasn't downloaded any into anything intermediary, but meanwhile it's asking the server, please give me some damn video, because that's what the user wants. So, um, and we, we call that effect, we call it the woo-woo. Um, because sometimes you just have a little woo-woo in your app. You don't know how to translate woo-woo? It's not a word in English? I know, okay, sorry. I'm sure it's like, it up a lot of the woo-woo. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we're, we're, we're coming in close to the end. I'm sorry I'm going late. Uh, so, magic modem. So, uh, this is something that's really fun. So. Uh, the same way that pseudo-localization allows developers to be aware of, of language differences, um, we actually created some specialized Wi-Fi routers that we put around the office um, and allowed people to connect to them. And it, it's kind of funny. It was started by this guy who uh, was in Uzbekistan, and he, he total nerd. And he's in Uzbekistan. It's like, ah, wow, we have interesting network conditions here. I wonder if I could model it in software. Well, as it, can, as it turns out, he, you actually can. So this little device, it's running, a, it's running a, I think, FreeBSD and something, and it basically takes a bunch of data. So as you, you may know, uh, the Netflix platform involves these things called Open Connect. These are, these are kind of boxes that we install in various ISPs around the world, and it allows us to kind of profile and see how long does it take to get packets you know, from the edge to a device. We also have a, an app called, uh, th that I showed earlier, the, the, the Fast application, which measures the internet speed all over around the world, and so then we have access to that information and we can kind of look in and see, well, on various different, you know, ISPs and, and mobile network providers the world over, you can just dial that in and connect up to it and say, I wonder what it would be like if I could travel right now to, to downtown Moscow or New York or Uzbekistan, whatever, and, and we have that ability at the office. It's kind of cool. Um, and there actually is a, a talk about that. So if there are super networking nerds that want to look at it, um, come find me. I can point you out or you can just search for magic modem. And so, the problem then you say is like, well, what happens if I, you know, uh, humble developer don't have access to that? Uh, I can strongly recommend this. It actually does work. The network link conditioner. This is something that runs on the Mac or run, when you're using the simulator or it actually runs on your device and you can simulate different things with, you know, packet loss and, and you know, uh, imagine what other crappy network, um, uh, challenge networks are, are using, uh, and you can simulate it, and you can, if you don't do this, you're really doing a disservice to, to your users. 
All right, so the, the last thing I want to say is that I talked about building world-friendly applications, and I think uh, you can't build a world-friendly application unless you have a world-friendly team. And, and I, 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 I love the people I work with. I really do. This is uh, some of us, and this is at, at the baby shower of Harsha. She's in the middle. She's about to go on maternity leave. And, and, but an important thing is that you, you want to work with the people that come from all over the different worlds. You want a gender balanced team. You want, a, you, know, you want to have different people on your team because it's the only way that you can, you can have people that can understand what it's like to you know, live around the world. And, and I think more importantly, to have different ways of solving problems. You know, I talked about kind of like, I remember what it was like to go to the circus. Well, that's, that's, that's me. I'm childish still. Other people will have other experiences say, well, I remember I was you know, climbing Everest and I remember this is what I, whatever it is your life experiences, the more diverse, the wider you know, variety of, of life experiences has, it gets to the uh, better end result of problem solving. So uh, I'm going to leave with this as before we get to the questions section of this. Um, one moment while it rolls. <laughs> okay, so this is, this is the entertainment portion of, of our talk. So uh, that's uh, Steve, Canadian Steve, uh, who uh, came with us to India along with uh, British Ben, and he had this long beard, which in India confers great, you know, demands great respect. Everywhere we went in the streets, like, oh, Baba, let me kneel at your feet and ask you for wisdom and advice. And I was pissed off that they were paying attention to him and not to me, but I was not going to let that opportunity go by. I was like, I had my square reader out there. It's like, you can have a picture with Guruji for only $5. <laughs> And so, uh, but then after that, you know, not only did I not get the attention, but I had to have his damn beard in my face all the time. So, uh, at this point, I think I would like to do one thing, and that is to say, uh, Spasibo, uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs> sure. Thank, sorry. Hi, Mom. No, 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 it's a bad time. Yeah, people are leaving, I know. How did it go? I, I don't, well, let, let me ask the audience. Hang on a second. Uh, my mom wants to know, was my talk any good? And I think she does speak Russian, so if you liked my talk, you can say, Ochoy Horosho. How was my talk? Oh. <laughs> See, mom, I'm not an utter failure after all. <laughs> Okay, and, and the last thing is to say is, you know, I invite you to, to oh, I've lost my thing. End of show. Well, uh, I don't know how to get that back up, but I would say uh, on Twitter, I'm Jembe. That's D-J-E-M-B, like the West African drum. It's not my DJ name, it's a drum. Um, and I think now we are taking questions. <laughs>